Peter Fikowski. Today's guest is the founder and chairman of the Climate Restoration Foundation and author of Climate Restoration, the only future that will sustain the human race. He is an MIT-educated physicist, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He'll also share insights about his superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show. Peter, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. It is such, I, I'm so intrigued by your really leading edge ideas, cutting edge, innovative, off the mainstream kind of ideas about climate change. So uh, I, I'm just excited to hear you. So thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is a real privilege to talk to you and especially your audience. Um, the, the, our preparation for this really got me thinking in ways I've never thought before. So, oh, it, so well, you're, you. you're kind, but uh, your book uh, and your ideas, your organization, everything you're about now is about this idea of climate restoration. And I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but but you you have framed this for me perfectly by pointing out that what the world aspires to right now is to meeting the Paris Climate Accord goals and objectives, which would achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And the result of that is going to be to avoid the very worst egregious versions of climate change, but by no means avoids climate change. Many devastating things would happen. And so our our, our goal that we are struggling to achieve as a global society is mediocre. Uh, it is barely, no one can describe it as good. It, it's just the best we think we can do. Tell us about your vision. Your vision is different. Tell us about what you've got in mind. Yeah, my vision is <clears throat> based on the fact that we all would prefer to leave our children with a climate that humans have actually survived long-term. It's very simple. I, I've shared that with thousands and thousands and no one's ever said, no, I prefer a, a future where you know, our, our survival is in doubt. No one's ever said that. And of course yeah. the, the UN goals are uh, less than 50-50 chance of, of humanity continuing. Um, I, I call the UN goals the UN uh, a suicide pact because, um, well, because it is. <laughs> and so <laughs> no, no, no disrespect meant it's a historical thing. And yeah. the, the, the trick is to let go of the past for a moment and think about the future and who in that future. And so... Um, the, the bottom line is we all want to restore a safe harbor climate that humans have survived long term. We all also want to restore reasonably quickly a safe harbor population. And that's just because we, we want to sustain humanity. And the great news is that these safe harbor goals can be achieved. We've got the mechanisms and finance for it right now. And what's also cool in this crazy time is they don't require government finance, although that would help. And that means that if the, our government changes and we go back to leave the Paris Agreement, that's okay. It'll slow things down a tiny bit, we'll sweat bullets, and we'll still restore the climate. And so then the question is, okay, if we have everything we need, what's needed? And what's needed is, is keeping an eye on that goal that we think about, about a, a healthy climate and, that, and actually say it aloud. And that's what's missing. Yeah, it, it is a, uh, a fascinating, fascinating uh, idea that we can actually restore in the same time frame so much of, of what's been uh, done wrong. I mean, the... Uh, it is sort of magical. So let's so let's get into uh, some of the nuts and bolts here. How yeah. on earth can we possibly achieve this when in f our, our conversations around the Paris deal are that it's almost unachievable uh, by consensus view, and yet you're saying we could do so much better. How do we do it? 
Well, um, if you look into the history of our planet, uh, you probably have heard about ice ages every 100,000 years. And uh, obviously the planet gets a lot colder during an ice age. CO2 levels go down by the same amount that we've raised our CO2 levels. And that means that nature has removed that same amount of CO2 that we are going to remove. It's done it 10 times in the last million years. And so the easiest thing to do is simply do what nature did. And doing so turns out to be a viable business. It produces a lot of fish in the ocean, um, which uh, pay for the small amount of activity needed to make it happen. There, uh, in my book, I talk about the big four. So that's the big one out of the big four. And we can go into the other ones uh, when you think it's the right time. Okay, so what, what's the big one? Tell us about that. The big one is ocean iron fertilization. And uh, if you think about the ocean, well, when I think about the ocean, I think about Hawaii and the blue ocean. And blue isn't green. You know, a green ocean has photosynthesis happening. And what it takes to turn a blue ocean green, and most of the blue ocean is minute amounts, amounts of iron. So it's like a hundredth of a teaspoon per square, per square meter. And, um, and that will turn it from blue to green in a few days. Um, you get the photosynthesis happening. Uh, fish and birds come feeding on the, on the algae, on the phytoplankton. Um, eventually, the, all, all the detritus falls towards the middle of the ocean. About 10% lands on the seafloor. Um, but it stays suspended there in the deep ocean, you know, it's five, seven miles deep. And um, at the end of the ice age, the currents change, you get oxygen in the ocean again, and it does rot and turns into CO2, and then the planet warms up again. And so we can duplicate that in very much the same way nature does it. So when nature blows the iron over the ocean in the form of dust storms, it's localized and it's intermittent. When it does a volcano, it's localized and it's intermittent. So what we do, it, it was done once, sort of once and a half um, in the uh, Gulf of Alaska 10 years ago. And you put, it in, uh, put uh, this very small amount of iron into an eddy which is like when you pull the plug on your on your sink, you get a little, little whirlpool eddy. And those are all over the ocean. And it keeps the iron contained within this 100-mile diameter. And that allows the ecosystems to develop over two, three, four months. And, uh, you know, and, and the data seemed to indicate that when they did that, it removed uh, 100 million tons of uh, yes, 100 million tons of CO2, which is amazing. And wow. the whole cost of doing that was two and a half million dollars. So to do to scale that up, it requires about 500 of those. And uh, that that two and a half million dollars, most of which went to science. So uh, only about one million was actually operational cost. The return yeah. on that was about a uh, hundred to 500 to one in terms of fishery uh, output. Wow. When you talk about algae, you know, living here in Florida, as I do, I think about the unhealthy, dangerous, sickening algal blooms that uh, occur seasonally here uh, and in other places. Uh, what prevents the deposit of iron in the ocean from creating more unhealthy situations like uh, algal blooms like that? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, and the answer is, is quite simple. The level of iron, of course, in, in Florida, the ocean is, uh, most of it is, is quite green. You have lots of nutrients there. If you add more nutrients, then you start getting bad, uh, bad algae growing. The deep ocean, you have vastly less nutrients. And the amount of iron is about one millionth not a thousandth, but a millionth of what it is near you. And so adding wow. a little bit of iron to that is still vastly below levels needed to uh, get the coastal problems that you see. Oh, interesting, interesting. Um, you mentioned that, that 
to iron in the ocean is one of the big four. What are the other three? Yeah. Well, uh, so the, the iron in the ocean duplicates how nature does it for ice ages. The second one is limestone. And over, over hundreds of millions of years, nature has removed 99.9% .9 of the CO2 on our planet under the sea in limestone. By, uh, in shells, shells and skeletons of, of fish and so on. And uh, if you think of the, um, the White Cliffs of Dover, then you're picturing that limestone. And we can do the same thing um, by essentially synth doing synthetically what, a, what an oyster does. If you imagine an oyster in an oyster shell, you can see this little measly animal um, making this big shell. And it, it's low energy and um, it's natural. The oyster gets the CO2 from the water, which gets it from the air and gets calcium from the water. And there's a company here in Silicon Valley that does the same thing. And so it produces limestone and you know, limestone sand, limestone gravel used in concrete. And uh, it gets the, its CO2 either from power plants, as long as we have natural gas power plants, which won't be much longer, and, um, and uh, or you know, oil refineries. And when those go away, again, another 10 or 20 years, then uh, it'll get it from the air, which is amazingly easy to do if you think about it right, which, which they've done. And they get calcium from a wide range of sources. Uh, ultimately, they can get it from the ocean like an oyster does, but there's a lot of other sources. And um, that, 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 limestone, that synthetic limestone, there's a, a market, a trillion dollar market for rock, for the concrete that's used in the concrete in our roads and buildings. And there's a, we use enough right now so that by... Uh, by 2050, we could actually have sequestered all trillion tons of excess CO2 in the air in the, in our, under our feet in the form of concrete in our roads and buildings. So that, that's, uh, that's the second one. And again, it's profitable. That is the, the need for that rock is, is high and it, it's competitive with quarried rock. And with a little nudge from governments to say, really use whenever possible, use the synthetic limestone, that the very, very promising pathway there. Then uh, the third one is uh, another ocean for uh, ocean uh, 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 photosynthesis pathway, mm -hmm. and and that's uh, seaweed. So kelp and uh, and uh, sargassum are the fastest growing plants on the on the earth, and there's plenty of water, plenty of sunlight, and so um, you can grow those. It takes more uh, more considerably more work than the phytoplankton, but uh, it's again viable. And the, uh, so those are the three major CO two removal. The fourth of the big four is methane oxidation. And so again, modeled after nature, the, um, methane is becoming a problem. What I got involved in methane uh, mainly because I was worried about a methane burst out of the Arctic. Our, our, we, yeah, we've lost 95% of the ice in our Arctic, in the sea, the sea ice in the North Pole. And um, the last time our planet went through this process of having a, an ice cap for several million years and then losing it, we had um, uh, a big methane burst and we lost about it. the heat, the, that heat spike uh, extincted about a third of the species on the planet. Um, and that obviously would be very dangerous for humanity. And so... I realized that the way out of that, it took me a while, but it, the way out of it is simply to double the rate at which the methane is oxidized in the atmosphere. So when uh, methane is the same, same thing that you have in your gas range and uh, natural gas, and uh, it oxidizes naturally in the atmosphere through various chemical reactions. And uh, it has a half-life of about eight years. So uh, for any... Uh, gallon of 
methane in the air after a year, after eight years, it would be about a half gallon left. And after another eight years, only half of that would be left. And doubling the oxidation rate uh, would reduce the methane level by a factor of two, which is very exciting because it, uh, I did the calculations and it's been confirmed, uh, very simple calculations, that that would bring the cooling on the planet back down to what it was in 2005. And so that's before the, the big wildfires, before the big hurricanes, um, before the, the Arctic, um, what would you call them? The cold Arctic, um, well, yeah, you and I will think of the name of that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> in the winter. Um, right, right. And so we could actually get back there in five or eight years doing it this way. And so what we, so this is, uses iron chloride, which is a, a natural chemical you get in the atmosphere, very small amounts of. But um, we can disperse it from ships in the ocean, um, very small amounts. But um, cumulatively, it will oxidize. It'll use the sunlight to oxidize the methane twice as fast. And then what happens is, if the burst, which is already beginning in the Arctic, if that burst becomes bad, it probably won't be. But probably is no good for yours and my kids. Right. Um, right. If that burst does get bad then it will, uh, because it will reduce the half-life by half, um, or we could do, do more and bring it down by a factor of four, uh, the burst would be so short and so weak that we wouldn't lose the harvest. And that's sort of, that's the goal there. So it, it's the an insurance policy against a, a methane burst. And by the way, it'll also save the insurance business about $40 billion a year by bringing the climate back to what it was 15 years ago. So yeah. uh, those are the big four. And that could happen and, by the end of the decade. All, all of those uh, I'm committed will, uh, that is, I can't think of any reason they won't. <laughs> that, that's the amazing ah. thing. People say, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm skeptical. I say, well, give me a reason it won't happen. And yeah. no, one's, no one's gotten gotten to the mat and given me a reason that it wouldn't happen. Well, yeah. the reason that people often say is, well, those evil guys. Now, if you're liberal, it's those evil conservatives. If you're conservatives, those evil environmentalists. <laughs> but it's those guys would prevent it. Now, whenever I talk to those guys, they say, no, we're totally with you. I've never met anyone who would, who would block any of these. Now, they would say, do it carefully. They would say, right. convince me. But they don't, they would, you know. Yeah, yeah. They look at the data and they say, no, this is good. Uh, keep feeding me the data. I want to make sure we don't do something stupid. Yeah. Well, it, it is scary when we talk about uh, throwing uh, chemicals in the ocean or the atmosphere that we're yeah. somehow going to ruin rather than improve. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it does make sense for us to scrutinize the data, but uh, we got to do something. What we're doing now uh, our, our best path forward, that is the Paris Climate Accord path, is, is pretty crummy. Uh, you know, the, the, the world would continue to warm, as I understand physics, and I'm a novice, right? But uh, oh, yeah. for a decade after we achieve carbon neutrality. So this car, the Paris Climate Accord doesn't really achieve any improvement in the climate until 2060. And that's yeah. if we achieve it, if we achieve and and no one thinks that we I shouldn't say no one, but people, smart people are very nervous that we can't do it. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the key is this. I, I call this whole phase of going, you know, of, of restoring the climate that humanity going through a bar mitzvah. And so when we, we've been doing uh, science, which sounds like a very adult activity, but it, if you look at it, and I'm a physicist, so I, I know about science, um, science is about observing the past and the present and predicting the future. And I remember being a child and you know that's what I would do. Like, I wonder where we're going for vacation. I wonder what's gonna happen tomorrow. I would look at the past and then predict the future. And that's what children do. Um, then, you know, when, after I had my bar mitzvah, but at age 13, I spent the next 20 years growing up. 
<laughs> sort of the bar mitzvah opened the door. It didn't make me an adult, but opened the door right. to adulthood, at which point I was responsible for my life. And I wasn't responsible for just my life. I was responsible for my whole community, right? You know, if there was trash on my street or the street, it was my job to pick it up. I could pretend it wasn't. And um, uh, looking at, at the future as an adult or an engineer or an entrepreneur, you say, who is it for? And in this case, it's for future generations for our community. And what do they want? In the area of climate, it's very simple. We want the same climate that our species use to develop agriculture and civilization. And the scientific term is getting CO2 levels to 280 parts per million. And um, it, you know, if you know what that means, that's great. If you don't know what it means, that's also great. <laughs> it's a number. And yeah. um, and sort of like the pressure in your in your tires, fifteen pounds per square inch, whatever that means. And right. um, so knowing what we want that we want to get there, then you know, just like you know, if I want to go to work or go to New York for vacation, I just do it. I set my GPS, check my credit card and my gas tank, and I go. It's like no big deal. It turns out restoring the climate is just like that. Whereas if you get, you know, you know, I'm guessing you had a similar experience to me. A teenager, get into the car. Where do you want to go? I don't know. We could go here. We could go there. And then you have a fight. And then an hour later, you're hungry for lunch and you abandon the whole trip. And that's how we've yeah. been going about climate, right? Is no one know, knew where we wanted to go. They said, we don't want to go to two degrees warming. So everyone has had their eye on two degrees warming, which is almost exactly where we're headed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, so it's a matter of growing up, the humanity growing up. Individually, we're doing fine, but as a as a group, now that we're one humanity that covers the whole planet, um, we it used to be that we would obey mother, you know, uh, mother nature, right? To take care of mother nature, just like you know when I was a kid, you know. I, my mom would take care of me. If I broke a glass, she would sweep it up and buy a new one. No big deal. Um, you know, once I <laughs> like the Pottery Barn uh, logo, uh, not logo, uh, uh, phrase, if you break it, you own it. You know, we, we broke the earth and Mother Nature said, okay, it's yours. Good luck. <laughs> and so that's, that's yeah. you know, and that's where things change. When you own the store, now you've got a plan and that's where we are now and my book the you know climate restoration the only future that will sustain the human race is about being adult and saying oh yeah let's restore back to what's good for humanity and it, it just like that thing about the car trip it's it really is that easy once you know where you want to yeah. go just set the gps does does your plan uh, allow for, encourage, tolerate? How do you think about burning fossil fuels over the next 30 years, over the next millennium? Uh, what do we do with all these fossil fuels that are in the ground right now? Yeah. Um, again, it, it's, it seems so difficult, doesn't it? It's like, oh my God, what do we do? What about the oil companies? And it actually is quite simple. And here's why, because uh, Clean energy, wind, solar, batteries, you know, if you're a nuclear fan, nuclear. If you're not a nuclear fan, not nuclear. I don't, you know, nuclear is so expensive now, I don't think there's a future for it. So, except in certain cases, you know, they'll keep using it in submarines probably. Sure. <laughs> so, and a few other places. But um, um, uh, it's so, the fossil fuel, in 80% of the planet already is more expensive than wind and solar and batteries. And the price of wind and solar and the price of batteries is just plummeting. The technology is advancing really quickly. And so um, the, the, the barrier to transitioning away from fossil fuel isn't our thinking. The barrier is simply uh, capital investment. You know, uh, you, you know, you and I need to buy our Tesla or Chevy Bolt or whatever it is. And that's going to cost thirty or $40,000. It's not a big deal. And we're going to have to buy a new car eventually anyway. And so it's going to be 20 years 
it's always 20 years as we shift the capital equipment. Um, and that's all it is. Now, if, we, if we're in a hurry, you know, it, rather than making people wrong for flying or for buying gas for their car or for heating their house, actually you don't hear people <laughs> blaming people for heating their house, but in effect yeah. they are. Rather than yeah. blaming them, you, you can actually help them with the capital equipment. You could say, you know, we'll give you a, a subsidy for sh switching over to a heat pump. You know, we'll give you a, a subsidy for, um, you know, for electric car. And that would yeah. accelerate it. It, it. It's actually that simple. It, if you do the math, it's a dollar and a half per watt to build clean energies, wind and solar on average around the world. And um, we need 20 uh, trillion watts of generation to replace all of our fossil fuel. If you Google it, that's what it is, 20,000 gigawatts. Yeah. So that's uh, $30 trillion that we're gonna invest in capital equipment. And we could do it now or we could do it over 20 years. You know, I'll let someone else fight that argument. So yeah. it, uh, we, we are gonna switch over and we can do it faster. If you do the math, which as a physicist, I love doing the math. It, yeah. um, if we were to, rather than switching over by 2050, which is everyone's goal, you know, all, all, every month more countries and states and cities are adopting a net zero by 2050 or by 2040. There's some by 2035 now. Everyone's going yeah. that way. If we said, okay, we're going to, instead of 2050, we're going to do it 10 years earlier by 2040. The difference it would make in the atmosphere is um, about 4% of the CO2 level, just 4%. And, and yeah. we're 50% higher than the highest humans have ever survived. So it's 10% you know, worse, or one, you know, one to 10% worse, depending on how you look at it. It's like, yeah. okay, fine, whatever you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what's the critical thing is to say, well, we're, we're gonna restore the climate and make sure that the big four that gets the CO2 down to that, to the safe levels and gets methane down so we don't worry about going extinct. Um, as long as you do those, then whatever you want to do on, on fossil fuels is going to work. There's, I've asked a lot of people, can you imagine any way to avoid uh, the energy transition? And no one's ever offered a, a way that made any sense at all. It's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. It's a long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right, Peter. Uh, Peter, you, you've done, you've accomplished a lot uh, as a physicist, as an advocate, as an activist. Uh, what is your superpower? Um, well, uh, I think my superpower is having people around me who support me. Actually, my superpower is this, is I did a, a seminar workshop 20 years ago, and on my wall in my office, it says, my mission in life is to leave a world that we're proud of to our children. And I had I redid that a couple of times before I ended up there. And I loved it because it was a mission that had nothing to do with me. And so I didn't have to worry about, you know, is this too egotistical? And um, every time I thought about it, it warmed my heart. It's like, you know what, that's what I'm here for, is to leave a world that we're proud of. And when I did it, I didn't know what that would mean. All I knew is that I would know it when I saw it. You know, I spent 30 years uh, work, uh, doing poverty reduction work with Sam Daly Harris, our mutual friend. And um, I could see that there was something beneficial happening, but... Um, but it certainly wasn't just about giving people more money or it wasn't even about saving lives. Saving lives is, <laughs> is a good thing, but I, that I could tell that wasn't my, where my heart was. My heart was seeing, seeing my friends smile and seeing, you know, being on this program and seeing you smile. And so <laughs> that, that, that's, that's my, my superpower is actually having a mission that is it turned out by fortune to be, I think, what our DNA has designed us for. That is, um, uh, you know, we have all the stories and myths and, and traditions we have, which is great. Um, and we also have the memory of our DNA and our DNA is designed 
to keep our DNA line alive across generations. And the way it does it is it, it manages our emotions a little bit. Uh, we enjoy those things which are good for our community and for society. Um, you know, so doing, you know, having very interesting interviews like this, you and I are smiling <laughs> broadly. We love it. Right. Yeah. You know, singing in the choir, making dinner for your family, making dinner for your block, making, you know, dinner at the church or the synagogue. All those things um, make us very happy. And you say, why? Yeah. Well, because our DNA figured out that contributing to the community, we want to make that have individuals be happy when they do it. So they do it more. And any DNA line, which was that was uh, not very interested in that kind of community development, they got clobbered by their neighbor w who had a strong community. And so we're, de we're designed to leave a world that we're proud of to our children. And I came across it purely by accident. And I invite any, I invite all of your, our, your listeners they just take it whole whole hog, leaving a world that we're proud of for our children. And you can yeah. figure out what being proud of is for you. Oh, that's great. I love it. Uh, I, as you think back uh, on how this mission has been uh, kind of a superpower for you, um, can you think of a specific thing you've accomplished because of that mission? Mm. Well, before I got the mission, again, working with Sam Daly Harris and results, we worked with, uh, we had a request from UNICEF to get the immunization rate, globe, to fund child immunization around the world. And uh, between 1980 and 1990, that, that rate went from 8% from North America and Europe to 85%, pretty much the whole world. Well, very much the whole world, except pockets where they didn't have access. Um, that was a phenomenal accomplishment. And that was before my mission. But it obviously, as you can imagine, it led to the mission. We did the same yeah. thing with microfinance with Muhammad Yunus and, um, and uh, turning around the AIDS epidemic uh, with, uh, believe it or not, uh, George Bush, the, the younger Bush. Uh, he, he was the catalyst for that. PEPFAR. Yeah, yeah PEPFAR. And, um, and so, that those were those led into it after that after it you know my accomplishment has been to really create this field of climate restoration and then have the courage to i'll, I'll say it really badly but go up against the united nations now every single person i talk to there loves climate restoration but you never hear them talk about it in public yet so it's not the individuals love it the momentum of 50 years of reducing emissions, it's hard to change that momentum. It's the yeah. same thing in academia. Um, every single academic I talk to over a cup of coffee loves it. Um, in public, uh, you know, they're not there yet. And so that's <laughs> one of my delightful jobs in the coming year or so. And the book is providing, I think, the catalyst needed to allow the, those institutions, United Nations and the scientific and, and the academic world to adopt the, the goal of um, the climate that humans have actually survived. Yeah. Well, fantastic. So yeah, innovating that is really my, my pride and joy. Yeah. And then, and then you know, I, I took that and we have to restore a sustainable population. And that's, again, been a delightfully difficult conversation to promote. It and just like uh, re you know, restoring the CO2 level is amazingly easy. You know, it co it, it'll cost at m about $2 billion a year for the next 10 years. And then we're then that every going from there, it'll be self financing, um, which is a, 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 about a thousandth of what we're spending on the energy transition. So it's like just yeah. dust. Um, it, it is just a, a tiny amount. Yeah. Yeah. So then restoring a sustainable population sounds really scary because we have 10 times the population that was very stable for 10,000 years since the last ice age. And it's like, well, how do you reduce the population? Probably four times, not 10 times, just because technology allows us to be more efficient. 
And um, th this, it's really easy because first you realize that it's going to take 50, you know, 80 or 100 years. By then, you and I and everyone alive now will have died natural deaths. So you don't worry about what to do with a lot living people. It's all uh, peop how many people are born between now and then. And, uh, and, and women actually are very good at uh, having decent control over how many children they have. And so it boils down to empowering uh, that just 15% of the population, just 15%, the women from age 15 to 40, uh, that's 15%, and empower them to uh, do the right thing for a sustainable population. Don't tell yeah. them what to do. They, they, they'll figure it out. You know, it'd be good yeah. to make contraceptives and sex education available, but uh, just they, they're smart. And that we know how to we know how to tell people not tell people what to do. So we that's easy too. Yeah. But and the, the trick again was to get clear on what what the goal is. Yeah. Well, Peter, uh, I am so grateful that you would take the time to do this conversation with me. It's just been uh, delightful, delightful. Uh, I'm grateful to you. Uh, before we wrap up, would you just tell people how they can get a copy of Climate Restoration and how they can contact you? Yeah. So Climate Restoration, um, you can get it from your favorite bookseller, um, you know, any of the online or your local bookseller. Uh, it's and then you can also access it from my website, peterfikowski.com. And Fikowski is F-I-E-K-O-W-S-K-Y, like sky, where we pull the CO2 out of, <laughs> and, <laughs> .com. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I'll be posting more blog pieces and articles on my website over the coming months. Fantastic. Well, Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I wish you every success in your efforts to restore the climate. I promise to succeed uh, on time <laughs> or earlier. <laughs> I, thank you. I, as I tell people, what, do you have a better idea for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There you go. All righty. Well, thank you. let's do some good. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show. Twice each week, we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.